thank you, first of all, to the organizer, Jean, Diana, and all the organizers to have the paper in the program. Uh, this paper is a joint work with uh, um, Giulia Fusi from the European Stability Mechanism and Angela Maddaloni and David Marquez Ibanez from the European Central Bank. And usual disclaimer, oh, we are in the wrong session. <laughs> I, I hope it is not me. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I did the same. I was I was in the other room. Well, I hope it's not my fault in any case. So. <laughs> yeah, no. I was joking. So, and my quote are, are from institutions, so the usual disclaimer applies, so it doesn't reflect any view from ECB or European Stability Mechanism. Only my view. Okay? That's the so the remote is not working, so I'm using the keyboard, okay? Now, what is the idea of this paper? This paper is about pandemic lending. Why we gave this title, pandemic lending? Because lend banks, during the pandemic, they play a, cre a crucial role. Why? Because uh, one, the policymakers have two goals to deal with that, okay? So the first one is, uh, of course, you are responsible for the safety and the soundness of the stability, so you don't want that... Uh, the, financial, the, the crisis is spreading from non-financial corporation to the banks. On the other side, there is a lot of interest that uh, you need to support lending to non-financial corporation householders in order to facilitate the recovery. So there seems to be two conflicting goals. Now, here is where model-based regulation is coming from. Okay? I'll gi just give me some second. Uh, first of all, I know that you know, but just to, give, to, give me, to, to, to spend a, a few seconds. What is model-based regulation? This is a, a very, probably the most uh, historical change in regulation. Uh, we were joking, like the Copernican Revolution. So we discovered that is the sun that is stopping and the earth that is going around, uh, or uh, the Kent's Copernican Revolution. So you know that the object and subject, subject are more important than the object. And so, Basil II, we know that banks in theory, know better the borrower, so they can fix the risk weights better than could be done externally by the, central, uh, the, the supervisors, okay? That have less information, less knowledge, and stuff like that. Now, what is the point? Here, we know a lot about, in, uh, in the literature, about the model-based regulation. We know that there may, may be a problem of prosicality, Okay, so in times where everything is going well, there is an economic development, then they, you tend to lend more, and the IRB system, the model-based regulation, so IRB is an internal risk based, uh, internal, uh, sorry, internal rating based. Okay, so banks decide there is weights on their own. I'm going fast because I know, I don't have to explain this stuff to you, okay? And uh, that's the idea. Procyclicality could be one of the reasons why IRB system entered there. One point is that we know from the literature that IRB models are okay, works well, when you have normally small type of events, the probability of the default of one borrower, okay? But uh, they are not very well calibrated for large systemically important shocks. We have a paper from Ben, from Vigran Veen, from Reiner, okay? Well, just, I think it's this, this number in JF is, uh, is out, that show that uh, you, you have a problem, okay? So this kind of model underestimate the level of risk in the analysis, and then you have, a, you have a problem of complexity. Okay, this kind of model are so complex. They are so difficult to understand, and you have a problem when it's something is complex, and then you have a problem of opaqueness. That's what we have. So at the moment, what we don't know in the literature is the main reason why they were applied is that they are more risk sensitive. So you don't have to apply, like in the standard approach, 100% to any borrower, okay? But uh, you are my customer, you are my borrower, I know very well you, so I can give you a risk weight to you, and then to you, and to you, and so all the risk weights reflect all the information, they are more risk sensitive. But after 20 years from the initial proposal, okay, the initial proposal of uh, <laughs> the Basil II was 1999, so it's more than 20 years, they were to calibrate it, but 2004 was accepted, after 20 years, we don't know, don't know yet, okay? If IRB models are really providing more risk-sensitive weights, and we don't know, okay, if this kind of model, what are the characteristics of the model that let 
to support lending more, okay? So at the moment, uh, most of the paper, I would say almost all the paper, treat IRB banks like a unicum. We know very well that IRB banks, IRB model, differ bank by bank, and to be honest, even within the bank. Okay, so that's what uh, is leading us to test. So what do we do in our paper? First of all, we try to answer these two research questions. Do model-based regulation increase the risk sensitive of the risk weights? And the second one, yes, it does. And the second one is going to have a direct impact on the investments of firms. Are firms reacting differently to this part? No, it doesn't. So what do we do? Well, we use the COVID as an exogenous shock. I mean, COVID is, uh, is really bad. But from this side, for us, it was pretty good. Because this is not a financial shock. Most of the paper that try to address this kind of literature, they deal with financial crisis, rain crisis. OK, something that is financial related, but in this case, is an exogenous shock. It's not coming, it's not arising from the financial system. We are focusing on the euro area banks. Why? Because we believe that euro area is one of the key, most important country that we have to deal, okay? Because uh, uh, I'm going to tell you just when we arrive to the sample. Now, what kind of data we use? We use the data from ECB. That's a very good point because we have data about large exposure, we have an accredit, we have data about the revision of the internal models run by the ECB. So we can merge all this kind of information in order to have our picture. What is the empirical strategy, okay? So I just said, so we start at the bank level, then we move to the borrower level, okay? But I'm going to give you more details about this. What is the contribution? This is a crowded area of research. We try to give a contribution to lending during crisis. There are many papers. And what is the idea? Well, our shock is not a financial shock, okay? It's not a shock arising that it was starting from the financial system. It's a shock that is starting from non-financial system, okay? From non-financial corporation, and it can result in our part. So this is pretty exogenous. I don't think no one I mean, believes that COVID is due by banks. Banks have a lot of problems, but I don't think COVID is one of the responsibility of banks. Now, the capital, capital requirement lending, there are many papers that deal with this part, but this kind of analysis is starting from, there is a capital increase, there is a stress test, there is a, some regulat regulatory intervention. In this case, there is no regulatory intervention, okay? So this kind of shock is not due to a supervisor or regulatory action. But the most close area of research for us is there a research of model-based regulation. We have papers that show the cyclicality. We have a paper that show that the IRB are somehow reporting lower risk levels. Uh, as I say, the most recent paper is a great paper. is from Ben, Reiner, and Vigraming. And what is the contribution we can give to this part? First of all, let me start with our paper. We focus on large exposure. Why we're focusing on large exposure? Large exposures uh, in Europe, on the European side means uh, all the exposures that absorb more than 10% of capital, eligible capital of the bank, okay? So just to give you an idea, we are talking about uh, exposures that are greater than 300 billion, okay? So why this kind of decision? Because this is going to reduce, if you use an accredit, we can have a larger number of observations, but we focus on large exposure for one reason. Because during the crisis, uh, I need a mouse. During the COVID crisis, lending was supported by guarantees differently in Europe by different countries. So the German support to lending was different from the Italian, from the French. So it would be a nightmare to control for all this stuff. So large exposure, this is the quota that you get. Greater than 300 million, okay, in terms of loans, in terms of volume, is very narrow, the quota of guarantee. So all the positions that you are covering, they are not supported by government guarantee. So we are removing one of the criticism that we may receive uh, from our side. So the lending, in our case, is not biased by the government intervention. Okay, let me be back. 
The second one, we have an international sample. The IRB, especially in Europe. In Europe, we have the single supervisory mechanism from 2014. Means that we have one centralized system from 2014. Most of these IRB validation were made by local authorities. So, Bank of Italy give the validation to the Italian banks, Bank of France for the French, for the German. So most of the study, they focus on a single country. Our study is focusing on all the countries. Okay? So basically, we can complement the analysis that you get from other papers that are specific, very often, of a single country. And the single country is the experience of, between the central bank and the banks that receive the validation of the ARB. Okay? The last one. We try to do something that is pretty challenging, opening the black box. The IRB system from Unicredit is different from the one of uh, Santander, from the one from Deutsche Bank. Why? Because everybody was validated by different unit, they have different data, different methodology, different models. So what do we try to, say, to do? We try to open and check which parameters are used by this model. Okay, we could use uh, the trim information, so from the exercise that ECB run for this part. Just in case I run out of time, okay? So what do we find? IRB banks reduce lending during non -financial to non-financial corporation more than standardized bank. Okay, this is at the bank level, and this is also at the low level when you use a multiple lending relationship. Okay, same borrower with two different banks. Now, we play with uh, absorbing capital. So this is, uh, the effect is even greater for banks that, for position that absorb more capital. This is more evident for sectors that were more affected by the pandemic. Not all sectors, not all the borrowers were affected in the same way by the pandemic. And then we try to open the black box. Capital. If you are an NRB banks and then you have capital, you have an option. You can decide to lend or reduce your capital. If you don't have enough capital, we measure excessive capital, okay? So the capital in advance to the strap capital. So pillar one and pillar two. If you have more capital, you have an option. You can decide to drop, your, to reduce your, your equity or not, okay? And then we found that equity play a role. And then we found that looking inside the black box of the ARB, if you have a downturn LGD parameters in your ARB, means that you are including your ARB model I don't, turn para, I don't turn LGD parameters, then you're accumulating more equity capital during normal times, and then you can support lending during the bad times. Okay, and well, then we try to roll out different explanations. Data, okay, I already told you, ECB data, large exposure, and stuff like that. Okay, so I already skipped this part because I, I told you. Now, bank level analysis. This is standard diff in diff model, okay? So basically we are comparing IRB banks over standardized bank. Then we have, a, what we are running is, we have a lot of controls, and then we controls, we run the controls over after the COVID. So we have two quarter prior the shock, fourth quarter, and uh, sorry, two quarter prior, two quarter after, okay? Uh, the three quarter, first, second, and third quarter of 2020, and the fourth quarter of 2019. Okay, so let me show you some results, okay? So this is the results at the bank level. What we find pretty easily, sorry, I'm going to use the mouse, okay? That you have a drop, okay? And then we talk about, we started with a very general large measure of lending, credit origination. Credit origination means on balance sheet plus off balance sheet, internal and external margins, okay? Then we focus on on balance sheet and then we focus on loans, okay? So basically what we find is that we have a drop in loans. Now we try to control, I, we know, IRB banks are very different from standardized. We try to control for sides, they have a different sides, they have a different distance. Distance means uh, equity capital, okay? So how far they are from the minimum pillar one and pillar two requirements. We control for return on asset, different profitability. We control for different liability structure, the deposit ratio, so business model of the bank. And also we control for the least weighted density risk weighted assets over total assets, okay? We try to control for that, and then we observe this part. But I know, I will never be able to convince uh, RFRE that we are controlling for everything, so we move, uh, oh, sorry, we have also country time fixed effect in order to control for the demand 
possible shocks, but we cannot control for everything, so we move to the borrower level analysis. Okay, so we focus on multiple lending relationship. Frank is receive a loan from one, one bank and another bank, so we are restricting to this kind of relationship, and, but the model is exactly the same. And now we are considering borrower fixed effect times here. So in order to capture everything that we cannot observe at the bank level, level. okay? So still we can document the drop on balance sheet and especially loan and securities. But nothing for the long commitments or the other stuff. Okay. Sorry, long commitments are increasing but not for the off balance sheet, okay? So there is an increase in long commitments. Now, let's see how robust our results, okay? So we, this is probably uh, what we heard from our previous explanation, okay? But now we run a battery of tests. So let's, first of all, to check an alternative identification. IRB banks are different from standardized, so let's reduce our focus only to the IRB. IRB with an excess capital, IRB with less capital. Less capital, they don't have an option. In order to fulfill the minimum requirement, they have to, keep the lo they, they have to drop loans, and this is what we find, okay? So the drop of loans in this case is much higher. Okay. Now, let's see alternative explanation. If, which kind of exposure they are dropping? The one that absorb more capital, okay? So we control for credit risk mitigation. So the drop is greater for this part. The drop is greater for the most affected sector. And the drop, we don't find any difference between domestic and international uh, credit exposure, okay? Now, let's see, get inside the IRB, okay? So let's move now with banks with more capital and less capital. Sorry, this is the, uh, the second step. Let's move now to the downturn LGT. So we restrict our sample to the IRB, and then we have banks that included the L downturn LGD and banks that didn't before. Now, an important result. This is positive. So there is a positive bias of one bank over the other one. Showing that if you have the downturn LGD in your model, you can support lending more than bank that didn't. Okay? And this is, I mean, seems to be pretty obvious. But this is an important result because we are going to differentiate IRB banks inside, including one of the parameters that we are including. Sorry, I'm hurry. Okay. So we control for different risk management abilities. So you may say, well, some banks are stronger, larger, they have a more a better risk management department, prosecuality, zombie lending, capital constrained banks. So we, 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 we build this part. And the final one, I still have uh, three minutes. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the last part is about the economic impact. Okay. So we want to just double check. This uh, drop in lending from IRB banks is going to result in lower investment and how the borrower are doing to support their investments during the COVID period, okay? So basically we build, we, we move now from the CB database to the Orbis, okay? In order to take the uh, annual data about the potential investment and then we merge the information about the IRB. So we build one variable that is uh, the ratio between the funds that a company received from an IRB bank over the total assets. So the quota of funding of total assets arising from IRB. And this is what we did, with that. We did okay? So normally we don't find, we have different kind of assets, trade and receivable, okay, current assets, very short period. Trade and receivable, inventories, and then we move to the fixed assets, tangible assets and fixed, intangible fixed assets, okay? Normally, we don't find big differences, generally, between the two groups, but we found a drop for the 2020, okay, the year of the IRB. Now, how they try to increase to support this part? Well, they normally, okay, they issue capital in normal times. Okay, if you have more capital, you can run more investment, that's pretty obvious. But in 2020, okay, what they did it, they reduced the reserve which is pretty obvious, one minute, yeah. Okay, so basically what we found that the, in order to support the activities, companies that re receive a drop in lending, they use their equity reserve to support their investments. Now, take away. What I want that you remember. First, according to our paper, okay, the IRB model works, so they are risk sensitive. They react to the COVID, 
increasing the risk weights, and then there is a capital shortage, and then the decline loans. Not all the RB banks are the same. If you have a downturn LGD, then you can support lending more than the other. If you have a more capital, then you don't have to drop lending. You can still carry on your analysis. And how banks normally survive, they try to use their equity reserve to support this part. Okay? So I run a bit, sorry about it. If you want to have the paper, we are cleaning, sorry, uh, it's, it's very hot. <laughs> so we are drafting, cleaning the mistakes and stuff like that, but I'm very happy to share it with you. Okay? Thank you. Okay. So thank you, Dejan, for inviting me and choosing me as a discussion for this paper because um, it's something I've been spending some time on. And let me do a bit of a maybe strange discussion in the sense that let me say up front, I do believe all your results, Franco. <laughs> I believe all your results. I think they are, they are true. <laughs> but, 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 but let me, but, but what I, what I, what I um, no, but, but I want to say that up front because what I want to do, what I want to discuss is maybe some of the interpretations and maybe what I think or, 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 or we all can think about it. I'm not done with, with I'm, I'm not sure what I think, what the results mean, but what do your findings really mean for the regulator or, or for us to, un, to, to really learn what model-based regulation does in such a situation. So I'll have a lot of comments on this, but this doesn't mean I'm critical on the paper because I, I do believe all the results you've shown. Oh, oh sorry. So the intro states two questions. The first, does model-based regulation increase risk sensitiveness? of capital requirements. I would have said up front to this question, obvious, I mean, by design, because the alternative, the standard approach, capital requirements are not risk sensitive. So the only cases where this is not true is if banks can cheat entirely, they can just report to the regulator what they want, and, and, and then there's no risk sensitiveness. So, um, Regulatory forbearance, that's something that happened actually with the IFRS 9, with, 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 with the new um, accounting rules, it happened. It was entirely, the regulator said, you can just ignore all the new rules and, and uh, ignore uh, COVID. You can just assume a macro scenario without COVID. And um, third is, if the bank has foreseen this shock, which is, would be very unlikely because of the COVID shock, and, and they would have foreseen it in their risk parameters and they have already incorporated it. So I would say um, it's obvious, but I would say it means that, as you said, it works, and, 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 and somehow these, this one and two cannot entirely um, take away the effect of model-based regulation. The second one is a bit of model sensitive, sensitiveness to risk always results in lower capital requirements. This question, to be honest, I found a bit odd because nobody would ever claim that. Why should it? I mean, if a bank has enough capital, um, it doesn't matter if, 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 if the regulatory capital requirements vary. If, if the constraint is far from binding, we wouldn't even expect it. So, so, so I thought the second question was a bit, the first one is definitely more interesting. Um, so, so as I said, the paper really applies the state-of-the-art methodology, and, and you have fantastic data, which I think you could exploit even more, and I'm going to talk about that. But my, really, my, my, my point here is the, is the last one. What do we learn from these results? What does it mean that a bank, once a shock hits, reduces its lending because it's forced to by model-based regulation? And um, I, was, I wasn't sure if it's desirable or undesirable, I think. And, and that's what the paper should discuss. If this is a desirable result, if you, if you would want to see a coefficient that's really loading on, on model-based regulation, cutting lending or not. And I think um, we really have to put ourselves in the situation where we've been once the shock hit. So ex post, I would probably take the stand that um, they shouldn't reduce their lending, the government programs were very, 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 very fantastic, and, and, and we are, it was very good that the banks um, kept supporting the economy because otherwise we might would have had a recession, which, which, which didn't really occur during COVID. However, at the point in time ex ante when the shock was hitting, there was so much uncertainty that I would probably, I mean, I was discussing with, with, with Bundesbank that I said you should be much stricter 
and ensure that the banks cut their lending now and that they build up higher buffers because there will be so many bankruptcies coming later on. I, I, I mean, it depends really on your perspective. And I think this is, this is really, um, if you want to say whether banks' reaction wa was desirable or undesirable, it's really about the ex ante expectation on how the shock would be. And, and if, if you expect a high shock, it should be a high cut in lending. If you expect a, a, a low shock, it should be not be a, um, it, it shouldn't be. However, um, you have this international evidence, and I think you could do much more by, by taking countries that obviously had a harder shock versus those that had a moderate, more moderate shock, and I think you could look into that. But let me say one more thing. Um, so the idea of model-based regulation is really that if you can foresee a recession, that you are forced to early build up um, further buffers. But here, it's an unexpected shock. So in a way, model-based regulation cannot work or shouldn't work. It's not designed. By design, it can't work. So, so I'm not even so sure whether um, we can learn about the COVID shock, if it's an unexpected shock, so much on how banks should react, because that's why the regulator did all the programs that you've been citing and stepped in and said to the banks that you, you, this time you can really... Um, it's not your fault, it's someone else's fault, as, as you write, but, but I'm, I, I was just not so sure what I can really say about um, the COVID shock and, 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 and your, your, your conclusions about the, I mean, that's the second broad comment, it's just that about the advanced IRB models where you use these downturn LGDs, I, 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 I put a, 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 cite, a quotation in red, and that was just something I was reading, and then I remembered my own research, and we found out that these advanced models give you much more maneuver to manipulate these models, and you had this exactly opposite conclusion from our research, that the more complex the models are, the better they work, the more resilient it is, and I really, I deeply believe in the opposite. I think the more complex you design things, the harder it is for the regulator to, to see it, so, so I would have said, okay, um, there is some selection who is choosing these advanced models, who is choosing these our downward LGDs, and you have this fantastic data, so you could say much more on this, and, and, and you could, could prove me to be wrong. I have two specific comments, and that is, what is the shock? And I'm unfair here because I'm looking at Germany and, and, and not at, at, at Europe, but I don't know if European data looks different. I, I really don't know it. But according to this, if, if you, you understand what model-based regulation does, you have your loan portfolio, you take the last three to five years past data, and you calculate basically the probability of default. If the average of, of, of defaults is higher, your PDs increase. If the average is lower, your PDs decrease. So according to this graph in Germany, there was this government action for the real sector that suspended um, insolvencies for, for businesses affected by the coronavirus. It means that when your shock occurred, the insolvencies went down, so the PD models did the opposite from what you, I think, assume. So, so you, you might should find the opposite. If you, if you, maybe for Europe it's different. I know that um, the regulator probably would have been surprised if you suddenly say COVID came in and our PDs are really much lower, but mathematically what should happen, and, and you have the data to, to, to look into that, and I would like to see these PDs. Mathematically, um, the PD models improved, the PDs went down, and you could have actually expanded your lending compared to the other ones, if, because your regulatory capital requirements have been falling, and you also see, and that's maybe also important, that in Germany, the aggregate lending was, there was no shock to lending, so there's no credit crunch. And, and, and also, this makes your, the interpretation of your results even more interesting. What does it mean if there's a shock and, and I'm reducing or not reducing? And I think you should put it in, in perspective to, to, these, um, to the overall macroeconomic situations in which the banks had, had been in this time. And then I would agree with you that I would say, okay, it somehow shows that these banks were probably acting more carefully, and this is desirable. But that's a bit the interpretation where I want to push you, that, that, that you start thinking and discussing these things in, in, in your paper. Um, as I said, identification, I believe all your results, and the elephant, however, in the room is that banks do select whether they are SA or IRB banks, and that tends to be 
not just size, but the business model. And what is important, so I, I, I'm not worried about these results. Which results I am a bit worried about are the ones where you have the um, capital of the bank as a right-hand side variable, because that's definitely not exogenous. So if a bank has, has high tier one capital, it basically means it was a very profitable bank, versus a bank that has very low capital at that moment when the COVID shock was hitting. It's not really a, a choice so much. It's more really depending on your performance of, of the banks. And, and, and I mean, Deutsche Bank was, was having low capital for a long time, not because they were um, choosing to do that, because they, they really underperformed so, much, so badly and were unprofitable. So, so, so if you see that an unprofitable bank reacts, uh, cuts its loans in a shock stronger than a profitable bank, then, then probably it's a different interpretation. So, so that was my actually only critical point about your analysis, despite I, I, I think, I mean, you've done all, all the great things. And what you could do in your paper is either you could, I, I, I would suggest you to do more, two more things, and could be two different papers, really open the black box of model-based regulation. You have the core rep, fin rep data. You could tell us how did the shock translate into these risk parameters. You can see the PDs and the LGDs. And, and did in Germany happen what I was expecting? Did the PDs drop? And did the banks, despite this, um, react in the opposite way? Then, then I would think this would be a fantastic paper and would be very interesting. But I want to push you to get us a little bit more into, into the um, details of, of these models and look at the risk parameters. And then I think there is even more we can learn from this. Yeah. Sorry. The second comment echoes a bit the comments by um, Reinhardt, and uh, in particular, uh, DBA, for example, uh, issued some guidelines for uh, European banks on how to deal with the deterioration of the parameters of the uh, RB models. And also, banks were allowed to use uh, macroprudential policy buffers to uh, support lending. Now, uh, this type of interventions actually go against finding your results. So basically, one, 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 one could argue that your findings are a lower bound, but, but, that, but that's something that I think you should uh, stress at some point in the paper. Thank you. So I, I had two comments. One is uh, the IRB models probably increase the sensitivity, but they probably also reduce the level of capital. And if they reduce the level of capital, then when a shock hits, two things are happening. One is you might react more vigorously to the shock, but the other thing is that you have less capital, which means you're more vulnerable to the shock. So both of those channels are consistent with what you would observe. And so, um, you know, from the regulator's perspective, we care a lot about measuring. We want risk sensitivity, but we also want robust banks. And so um, being able to disentangle which one of those ch uh, channels is going on is pretty important. And then I think I have an idea for you that would, that would maybe give you, squeeze some more statistical power out of this. So in the United States, um, uh, sometimes banks are bound by their risk-based capital, but sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're bound by their ordinary leverage ratio and, and stuff like that. And um, you should only react to cutting back on lending when you're bound by your risk-sensitive capital requirements. If you're bound by your risk-insensitive capital requirements, this behavior doesn't, isn't, isn't, um, isn't motivated by your increased risk sensitivity. But I think you can observe that in the regulatory data about whether or not a bank approximately is more bound by its risk sensitive or its risk insensitive capital requirements. And so if you have a triple interaction, I think if you look in the subpopulation of banks that are actually bound by the risk sensitive requirements, I think you'll get much bigger effects or, or, or more well identified and stronger effects. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, more questions? Uh, if not, so Franco, uh, would you spend uh, three minutes uh, briefly in response to all the questions. Well, I'll be very brief. So thank you. I really appreciate your discussion and comments and the, the, the idea of develop uh, our analysis, okay? And uh, um, about, uh, uh, let me start from the end, okay? Uh, so the two possible channels, okay? So we try to control for that, okay? Because we try, uh, of course, you have two options. You decline the, the, you keep the level of equity and then you decline the equity, sorry, they keep a lend, the level of lending and then you decline the equity. But this is not possible because this is possible only for banks that have an excess capital. And this is what we found, okay? So banks that have an excess capital, they keep the level of loans. 
banks that are very close to the, minimum, to the capital requirement, they drop the lending. Okay, so this is what we document. Okay, so uh, thank you for the idea for uh, further uh, the analysis more. Okay, uh, I didn't get this spillover effect because it was, uh, there was a problem with the microphone, so the first comment. About the second comment that you say, can you remember? Yeah. Okay, so we, we, we will think about it. Okay, that's, we, we want to stress this part in the paper. And the elephant in the room, I agree with you. That's why we move from the comparison between IRB and standardized to inside the IRB with, more, with excess capital or not, because we know that we can control for everything, but it's impossible to control for any difference. They are two different uh, kind of uh, animals in that sense, okay? So that's why we move to the second part. But I really appreciate your comments and the idea of developing this part. I'll be happy to discuss later if you like some idea. I don't know if I forget something. I did in three minutes probably. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but this is, this is, we are really working, okay? So we, need, we didn't circulate the paper yet. So this is the right moment to have suggestion questions and uh, everything. Okay. Yeah. yeah, this is something that we can do. Also, we want to control, for example, for the LTRO, so which is probably the, the facility they receive from the European Central Bank in funding. Yeah. Okay, this is another part. But never forget, they are, this is one of large exposure. So we are talking about big companies, like it could be Ryanair or it could be British Airways, or it could be the, 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 so they have also power in terms of the, 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 the borrower also have some power with the banks. Let me just make one comment about yeah. the input into this model, right? I mean, Brian has pointed out that bankruptcy is really low, but of course in March 2020 when we had shutdown, everybody was like, oh my God, Yeah. right? And so the question is, what input would banks even use in that situation? So if you take the realized bankruptcy, but that's not So I guess, I guess you just need to clarify to the reader what type of forward-looking measures actually go in and that may go exactly in the other way. Okay, we will do. That. That's a very good idea. We will do. Thank you. Just a clarification because I remember now. Uh, banks that use the downturn LGD are not the one using the, the advance. So there are banks uh, with the advanced model validated that are not using uh, the downturn LGD. So we, for example, in our test, we restrict also the counterfactual, only comparing advance with advance. But this is not the, 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 the screen between the two. Well, thanks everyone for coming to hear my talk. Really appreciate your time. And um, uh, this paper is joint with Cynthia Doniger. I work for a central bank. Don't update your priors on what they think. Um, uh, this is just my work and Cynthia's. Um, we, uh, we had great RA support. My brother actually helped me with some GIS mapping. Uh, it was a really fun project. And um, I look forward to hearing what you guys have to say about it. So um, we're going to be talking about um, this is a difference in difference event study. It is uh, about what happened when there was a delay in uh, the distribution of some uh, emergency financing around COVID. And we're going to, and hopefully I'm going to convince you that this is nice, beautiful variation. And if you are interested in your own projects, we use all publicly available data in this project. And so you can copy our methodology and hopefully cite us on all of your um, other projects that can look at small business shocks. Um, a lot of, we think it's very versatile. So um, 
the overview. Okay, so there was a program in the United States during COVID called the Paycheck Protection Program. What it was, was a forgivable emergency loan program. What it did was, roughly speaking, fund small businesses for 10 weeks of payroll. Um, it happened during COVID and the idea was to preserve relationships between employed people and the firms that employed them. And they did this um, for a lot of reasons, including that it was seen as being good policy. The unemployment insurance system in the United States was completely overwhelmed by the, um, by the number of people applying for unemployment benefits. And so there was a thought that, that we wanted to get money to people who were going to otherwise have nothing or could wait long periods of time. And um, the thought was is that larger businesses had other resources, other lines of credit, more cash on hand, and that we could use the, um, uh, and, and that this funding would meet a need by helping small businesses. Now, I um, will continue the custom in short paper series of not talking much about the literature review, but we do find estimates today that are substantially bigger than virtually all, not quite, but all but maybe one other paper in this area. And that's because we think we are looking kind of where, the, where you would expect to find this effect. So a lot of papers in this area look at um, the threshold and eligibility for the Paycheck Protection Program between firms above 500 employees and just below 500 employees. And then they look for, for evidence of the effect in say 600 person firms versus 400 person firms. But these are relatively, um, th those firms are much, much, much bigger than most of the firms in the program. So um, what, we, uh, what we're gonna argue is that even those firms had much better access to credit that made them um, more like 10,000 person firms than they were like 10 person firms. And so when we, and I'm gonna show you this later, when we get into the weeds on the effects on firms of different, different sizes, we're gonna find that in the smallest firms we get the biggest effects. And these, these firms often have no lines of credit. They really are practically a guy in his house with maybe a couple of employees these, or, or a barber shop or something like that. These are not firms that have other resources that they can really draw upon. So what do we find? Well, we're gonna find that delay in the provision of PPP loans, and I'll talk about that delay in another slide, um, uh, due to insufficient money in the PPP program. It ha had about $350 billion in the first round and it all disappeared in just a few days. Um, that that money, uh, that those firms that did not get the money um, substantially and persistently had lower employment than, than firms that, that did not. And um, we are going to talk about that this, that this led to that the delay in funding when measured at the geographic area um, starts to, leads to higher job losses in May and that these job losses last through the end of 2020. So um, you, it, you know, that might be shocking that, that a, set, that a uh, delay of just 10 or 11 days could lead to multi-month long uh, funding, but we're gonna, um, we argue in our paper, we won't have so much time to get into it today, that, um, that this is probably because these firms lost these employees and then they went on unemployment or they went into other, they went to other firms and that, um, and that, that led to, to pers difficulties in recall. Um, and then, uh, and I, I guess I said this already, that these effects are largest for the smallest firms and for the self-employed and you, for example, don't see these effects at all in government employees. You shouldn't see these effects in government employees. That's a, that's a falsification test, but, um, but we, you know, as desired, do not see that. Okay, so uh, is that legible? Yes, okay, good. So uh, this is the cumulative amount of money in the Paycheck Protection Program uh, disbursements. So uh, the program starts at the, at the very beginning of, of, of uh, April, and you can see that it very quickly spends the $349 billion in the initial round, and then that blue line is the exhausting, that's how much money is in the original line of funding, okay? So, uh, so there is no more money, it, it is not, it runs out midday uh, on the 14th, I mean on, on the 16th, and, um, and uh, some people, got loans before they ran out of money and other people didn't. And basically our identification strategy is in a nutshell that the people who got their money here and the people who got their money here are at random conditional on our controls. And we're gonna, I'm gonna go to, I hope, um, successfully go to great pains to convince you that that's the case. But roughly speaking, and this comes from um, T testimony before Congress from the largest banks talking about their Paycheck Protection Program loans that particularly for smaller customers, it took five to 10 days 
from application to processing for a loan. So that means that the loans that happened on the 15th and the 16th were applied for kind of in the middle of this period. And so some of the, and then basically the loans were first come first serve once the program got more money. There was a second act called the CARES and PPP Act, and uh, the CARES Act. And, and so the, uh, the difference uh, between getting your money here and getting there is really coincidental based on where in your queue of your bank you were located when they started to process their loans. And so um, what we're going we're, we're gonna to do is we're going to exploit variation in loan timing only around the exhaust station window as a way of getting a sense of which places got loans late and which place got loans early. So that, in a nutshell, is what we're going to be doing here today. And I hope to convince you that that is as if random assignment to early and late. OK, so in terms of data sources, I promised you open access data. This is open access data. So this is, we have loan level data from the, from the um, Small Business Administration. They were sued under the, of, uh, um, what is it called, the, uh, um, the Freedom of Information Act. They were forced to disclose detailed individual level data. We know a lot. We know what industry these guys are in. We know how much money they got. We know how many jobs they said they were going to save. We know where the firm is. We know the name of the firm. Uh, this, we know uh, like a lot about, about these guys, although we don't have anything like a unique identifier that we can use to match to other databases. So um, there, is a, there were a couple of different releases of this data. We, in this draft of the paper, used the 12 2020 release, which um, has the full, win, uh, the full set of all of these firms and the most granular data on how much money was dispersed. Um, we, in, we are going to control for a lot of things in the estimates that I'm going to show you today. And so we have the Johns Hopkins information on COVID cases and deaths. We're, the unit of observation that we're studying today, we aggregate to the um, CBSA, which is basically like the city level, the commuting area almost of a city. Um, and uh, we have co COVID cases in that area, which we use as a control for that. We also have the Oxford government response tracker. That's non-pharmaceutical interventions. Were the schools closed? Were, um, uh, you know, were gatherings restricted? Were restaurants open? Again, we want that as a control. Um, and then we use survey data from IPMS, uh, but, uh, but really it's just the CPS granular uh, uh, current population survey data on um, things like, are you employed? Did you lose your job? Um, th that's what that, so this is all, you could get all of this data. That's that, that, all of which is to say. Um, maybe it's not so trivial to merge it all, but, uh, but I think it's pretty good. Okay, how am I doing on time? Oh, good, that way, good. So, um, what we're gonna do is map, we know the zip code of every loan, so we're gonna map each loan zip code to a CBSA, and we do that with, um, uh, by, by mapping the, CB, the zip code to a county, and all counties are uniquely in a CBSA. Um, we, we, we do the zip code, it's based on the majority of the businesses. Some zip codes cross multiple uh, counties. Um, and uh, because of the limitations of the current population survey, we get about 260 cities, um, which we can observe this data on. And that's of the, I think, roughly 800 or 900 CBSAs that there are total. And these are, these are determined by having enough individuals in the current population survey such that the... Um, uh, such that, the, that there's no fear of uncovering the identity of the survey respondents by, um, by, doing the, by releasing it. So basically four or five uh, people from the survey. It's a very large survey, so this gives us a lot of, and it's deliberately stratified, so it gives us a lot of people. So um, for each of our counties, we're going to do share delayed. And share delayed is the dollars of loans that are approved in the second half of the window, in the second round. That's the two days after the, um, you start getting uh, money uh, in the second allocation, divided by the total dollars of loans that are appropriated on both sides of the window. We're noting that like, so the four, there are only loans on the 14th, the 15th, the 16th, the 27th, and the 28th. Everything in the middle, there's no money, so there's no loans. Um, and then what we're going to do is for each worker in the CPS, we're going to match that worker's labor market outcomes to, uh, a, and we're going to have a, a, a variable that says what was the share delayed for the, for the CBSA where that worker operates. 
So this is not um, rocket science. This is just basically we consider a, a county where a lot of the loans were delayed. That's a highly delayed county. That's one we think the shock was more is, is larger. And loans where the uh, where relatively few are uh, late. That's one where we think the shock will be smaller. But wait, you say, how can we do this? Isn't there a law of large numbers? These are big cities. Why don't we have? Um, why do we even have any variation here at all? I'll get to that in a minute. Um, here is our basic model. Um, uh, I probably shouldn't have put this such a complicated model up on the screen, but um, it, what we have here is we're going to interact the share delayed with the labor market with a dummy variable for each of the months in 2020, and that's going to let us have, subject to all of our controls, hopefully to give a um, a month-specific labor market effect of the delay. The um, April is a complicated month because the wave of the, P the PPP happens in April, but also the, um, uh, the, the survey happens almost in the middle of the, of the PPP problems. And so it, we get into, we do an exercise in the paper, which we won't have time for today, but for today, I'd like you to just ignore the April results. I want you to think of January through March as our pre-trend period. Hopefully there's nothing going on there. And then our May through December will be the, almost like the impulse response of the program. Um, we're gonna cluster our errors at the date, at the date CBSA level. Uh, we're gonna have data um, from 2018, um, just to have to kind of get rid of some of the seasonality and and, and to have pre-trend stuff, um, and uh, we're going to argue that the realizations of the remaining variation in shared delayed after controls is random, and therefore we're going to give our betas a causal interpretation. So, uh, what are our controls? Well, we have the uh, industry of the firm. We have a measure of how high touch is the worker's employment uh, job. We have information on the amount of COVID cases in your area and COVID deaths. Um, we, have, uh, we have information on the unemployment insurance of generosity in your state, and a couple of more that in my stress and panic of this talk, I'm not quite remembering. So there are, we tried to do a rich number of controls, although we did try to think through that hard about making sure nothing was a, kind of an intermediate outcome, bad control setup. Um, Okay, so I, I promised you a discussion of the um, whether or not the law of large numbers can kick in. So um, it's important to remember that there are New York cities and there are Miamis and other very large cities, and you might think that a law of large numbers hits here, but some of the CBSAs in, in our setup are pretty small. They might have 50,000 or 100,000 people in them, and they might not have had that many loans during the window period. Uh, and so what we do is we go, we make a Monte Carlo simulation of the um, of the loans, and what we do is we so we randomly reorder all the loans, and then we um, and then we assign we say the first 350 billion of those loans they get their loans, and then the rest don't, and we sort of re, so we re-estimate the um, the share delayed, and when you do that at the CBSA level using the actual loans, you can see that we can get about a standard deviation of roughly 10 percent, so we can get substantial cross-sectional heterogeneity purely with random assignment to CBS uh, of, of order. And then if we, if we do randomization on loan timing within, within the bank level, which means to say we assume that your bank matching was destiny and we just randomly um, reorder all the loans within a bank, we can see that we can get roughly to the total amount of variation that we observe. This is the total variation conditional on our controls. And so we think that this shows that there is nothing one, one doesn't need to go in search of an explanation for why some places were early and some places were late, assuming that, um, that some banks were slow and some were fast and, uh, and, and order was, was totally at random would get you all the way there. So, so we think that that's, um, if not persuasive, at least a strong indication that there is no deep underlying cause that has to make it, um, this kind of assignment happen. So um, I also want to argue that there are no real differences in the early and the late loans. That's also going to be important. It's not, this is not a simulation. So what this is is the average, um, these are some banking variables, some loan size variables, um, non-pharmaceutical interventions and unemployment, and cases and deaths. So what, um, I, I'm not tall enough to do this. Maybe I'll point with this thing. Nope, that's not loose. Okay. So remember, roughly April 16th, roughly April 27th, those, that's the event window. You can see those dashed lines. What we can see on the left is that um, 
is that in terms of branches and deposits, that there are some trends in the data that we see the biggest companies are actually early, but that there's a kind of freezing, a parallelness between this point and this point. These are loan sizes. Loans start off very big on average, and then they get smaller and smaller over time. But again, across the event window, it's the same on the 16th as it is on the 27th. When we look at unemployment policies and generosity, again, it's pretty flat. And then this is COVID cases and deaths. And we see, you know, COVID was getting worse during this period, but the difference between the beginning and the end where the loans are located is pretty good. So that hopefully gives you some solace. And we have even more of these that I didn't show you. So hopefully that gives you some solace that there's not some obvious unobserved um, macro or public health policy that's driving this, uh, this early late split. So here are my results. So um, this is the effect of, this is the coefficient. So it's a, a one, this is what the, the probability of being unemployed changes for a 1% increase in loan delay. Remember, here are my pre-trends, nicely overlapping with zero. I told you April was a problem. It overlaps with zero. And here we see persistent um, non-zero effects going from May to December um, from, having, uh, these um, from, from having this program um, in place. So this is the employment to labor force ratio. And we can see that we get um, reduced employment that lasts through the whole year. And you know, we, I can do a song and dance, which we had in an earlier version of the paper and which we're kind of taking out of the current one, where you can translate this into an aggregate number of jobs saved by the program. And we think that this is, this, this is suggestive that the program saved several million jobs. Um, and then here I'm going to do, this is not the same graph. Instead of employment to labor force, this is employment to population. And we can see um, this is a little bit less precise, but the broad trend in the results that we see is, are very similar. We can do other, uh, other normalizations with not in the labor force, uh, things other than employment. The stories are very similar. We get this long depression in population in places that have delays. Okay. So um, I promised you some analysis on heterogeneity. So here are the self-employed. We can see that the self-employed have, at least on the point estimates, relatively big effects. These are private employees. They have um, more, they're, they're, these have uh, slightly larger effects. And these are public employees that overlap with zero. So again, that's a falsification test because public employees didn't get PPP loans, so delay shouldn't really matter. And then here we have um, the size of the enterprises. So this is 500 person firms. These are 100 to 49. This is a subsample, as is this. Like knowing the, employ the particulars of the size of the establishment you work for is, um, restricts our sample for big, complicated, boring reasons related to the waves and the design of the CPS. But basically, again, we see the biggest and, uh, and, and statistically significant effect in the firms that have the f under 10 or fewer employees. So this is um, really uh, the whole, uh, I mean, we think that this is why our effects are big and everybody else's effects are small. Because if you try to identify on the difference between firms that employ more than 500 and fewer than 500 employees, you're looking at a group of people that don't really have much benefit from the rule itself. And I think that that's my last slide and I think I got 20 seconds left, so I guess I, uh, um, I have lots more results which aren't shown. We did a ton of robustness checks. We, um, we tried to deal with April and interpret them. I mean, it, you know, I showed you two graphs. I have got like 300 regressions in this paper. You know, please don't read all 300 regressions, but they're there if you want them. And um, uh, yeah, um, so thank you. And uh, I guess that's all I got. Um, the, the, uh, our analysis, we think, shows that the PPP was effective, which is in contrast with some of the other literature, which brands it as ineffective or a waste of money. Um, we got substantial negative um, labor market outcomes from the PPP. Hopefully, this could inform future designs of PPP-like programs to make them targeted at the most vulnerable firms. Um, we think this is consistent with these firms being relatively more cash constrained. And um, our source of PPP variation is computable entirely with public source data and so could be used for other projects and, and at other levels of aggregation. And uh, thanks a lot. Okay, so I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to discuss this uh, uh, great paper, which tackles a very important issue. So I will just briefly summarize the paper here because Ben uh, did a great job, I think, in, in, in presenting what the paper does and the identification strategy. So the paper study, uh, studies the effect uh, on employment of a delay uh, in the deployment of the 
Paycheck Protection Program in the United States in 2020, when the pandemic hit. The paper finds uh, pretty large effects. The paper shows that uh, if the initial PPP funding uh, under the care sect uh, had been 10% larger, enabling the share of delayed loans uh, in the event window to be just 20%, the unemployment rate would have been uh, 1.7 percentage points, sorry, that's, that's a typo, lower in May. Okay? So the effect is pretty big, and it is also persistent because uh, it goes through the end of the year, December 2020. And importantly, the effects are strongly uh, uh, heterogeneous. They're, they're much larger for self-employed and in very small firms. I just summarized the identification strategy, again, to, to think about it. Uh, I couldn't manage to get uh, the figure that is in the paper uh, in my slide in, in, in a nice way, so I just copied uh, uh, this picture from uh, Leon Strahan, that is uh, another paper studying uh, the provision of, of, of PPP loans by banks. And basically, the idea is to compare um, workers uh, working for firms that got loans just before the funds ended, so around 14, 15, and 16 of April, with firms that got the loan after, uh, in the second round of the PPP, okay, when, when, when further funds were allocated. And there are two key assumptions. The borrowers that are uh, approved just before the funds ended and after the second round started are the same, so that's just a random assignment, and also that the delay does not alter the demand for loans, okay? So uh, in my discussion, so uh, I think that in general the identification strategy uh, is convincing, uh, and the paper does a lot of things. I mean, it's very long, the appendix uh, has a lot of further checks. I actually think that the paper could uh, discuss uh, uh, a bit more the incentives of banks and firms uh, in uh, giving these loans uh, and in applying for these loans uh, and understand, therefore, the sources of such large effects. So uh, the literature actually shows uh, uh, some mixed results uh, on the size of the PPP. Some papers show that the effects are relatively small, for example, Ray Chetty and co-authors and uh, Granja and co-authors. Some other papers find uh, larger real effects, Falkender, Kurman et al, and this paper. Uh, I think that it is important uh, to understand uh, what drives the difference. Uh, and in particular, uh, the time lag between the first and the second round was rather short. So, uh, 11 days of delay, basically, uh, are making such a large difference. Uh, and the natural question is, uh, if you are self-employed, why not waiting uh, a few days more before deciding to shut down your activity? Or uh, the same for a small firm. Uh, a first answer, which I think is the answer that the paper gives, uh, is that uh, uh, the effects is actually driven, so the large effects are actually driven by self-employed and, and very small firms. So the self-employed, for example, uh, are typically using own funds to, uh, to finance their activity. They typically uh, have weaker relationship with banks. If this is the case, then they can be risk averse, and even a short time window can actually push them out of the market. So that's a possible story, which I think the paper may, may for example, uh, try to push and explain. But in my opinion, there could also be some alternative stories that are related to the incentives of banks and firms to give out these, these loans and to take these loans. Uh, and in particular, to enjoy the debt forgiveness that the PPP granted. So, uh, on bank side, for example, there is evidence uh, from uh, Lien Strachan and Granja uh, and Quotos that there are several bank characteristics that actually explain the size uh, of uh, PPP loans uh, uh, given by different banks, but also the allocation between first uh, and second round. So some banks were faster 
in, in, in giving out uh, PPP PP loans than other banks, correlating with some banks' characteristics. Now, I actually find very convincing the picture that Ben showed uh, about the Monte Carlo simulations, uh, which I don't remember whether they were in the paper, they maybe were, but in this case I missed them. But still I think the paper can also do something more to, to compare firms that were borrowing from banks with uh, certain characteristics that were correlating with the, uh, uh, with the higher provision uh, of PPP loans uh, in the first round. The second point uh, is debt forgiveness. So firms could get uh, debt forgiveness if uh, in 8 to 24 weeks later uh, than the loan disbursement, uh, uh, they were keeping employment constant uh, and at least 60% uh, of the loan proceeds were spent on payroll costs. So actually this could strategically uh, induce f firms to apply earlier or later. And there can be some stories. So for example, uh, there is evidence that uh, larger firms were getting PPP loans before and larger firms here could also be firms with 300 uh, employees. Smaller firms may be suppliers of these firms. So if you see that a large firm uh, to which you supply funds uh, uh, is getting uh, a PPP loan, then uh, uh, you may actually be pushed to apply earlier. If this is not the case, then you can self-select into uh, applying later. But in this case, maybe your uh, purchaser of inputs uh, that did not apply from PPP may actually uh, run into trouble. Uh, 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 if, this is a, uh, if this is the case, there could be uh, an impact uh, on firm activity. A similar story could uh, apply to banks, uh, and I suggest then that uh, the paper can actually try to, uh, uh, to show that the characteristics of the firms that got loans before uh, 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 the funds were exhausting and after the second round are similar across key observable characteristics like credit risk, profitability, um, uh, interest coverage ratio. Uh, 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 an additional point could also be that the paper could be uh, estimating both the effect uh, uh, of the delay and the effect of having uh, an established uh, uh, lending relationship. The Enstaran, for example, show that banks were faster uh, uh, in giving out these loans to customers uh, with which they held uh, established relationships. Uh, uh, if this is the case, then this could actually uh, explain the size of the effect. So the delay also captures the fact that late uh, uh, firms, so uh, 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 the firms that got the loan later, uh, are also firms that did not have uh, uh, an existing banking relationship. Uh, on the one hand, this could be uh, a potential problem uh, for the estimation uh, 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 of the effect of the funds on uh, unemployment decision, but on the other hand, uh, this type of parameters could not be uh, estimable in practice because uh, if you think that the firms that uh, 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 are not holding uh, uh, banking relationships uh, are typically those that apply late, then th th that's, 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 that's the only parameter that, uh, uh, that you can really estimate in practice, uh, uh, and that is relevant for policy. A similar point uh, applies to geography. Uh, again, the paper has a nice picture, a nicer than this one actually because it's more, uh, more granular, uh, showing the, the counties and the areas that actually got a, a larger share of delayed loans. Uh, I'm taking this picture from uh, uh, Lee and Strahan, uh, and, uh, and we can see actually that the states, so uh, uh, the states are less granular uh, unit of observation, but we can still get an idea of the geographical differences in early versus late um, obtainers of uh, early PPP funds. The West Coast, for example, 
uh, is characterized by firms that got uh, a larger share of late loans here. Uh, again, this dimension of heterogeneity can be relevant uh, for two reasons, for example. Banks that operate uh, in certain states and that are able to uh, obtain PPP funds earlier, so uh, are better able to process uh, applications and so on, can also help firms to uh, uh, obtain other support programs. But the second story could be the availability uh, of fast internet in the local area. Uh, its effect can be uh, amplified through time, so uh, before the pandemic, uh, the availability of fast internet uh, was less crucial. After, it was crucial both to process the applications for, for the PPP loans, but also to ensure that a self-employed could still keep operating and providing uh, the goods and services that he or she makes. Uh, I have two suggestions here. One possibility is to run tests matching local areas on pre-pandemic characteristics and potentially also um, on, the, on the size of the impact of the pandemic. Okay, so the matching done on the counties. Okay, so you match counties on, on observable characteristics and then of course you treat the, uh, the delay, uh, the variation in the delay as, as, as random. And the second suggestion uh, is to use the approach proposed by uh, Emily Oster in a, in a 2019 paper to measure the effects of unobservables on the results. Uh, again, with the idea of, uh, of, of providing further evidence that the counties that uh, have a higher uh, or, or lower share of delayed loans are really similar. A very small point on the specification, uh, I typically don't like making uh, uh, technical points here, but I think it would be uh, interesting to see results from less saturated specifications to better understand the relevance of the individual fixed effect. I mean, I'm very, it's, it's great that, that the paper works with the worker fixed effects. I mean, that's, that's super convincing, but it's still interesting to see what happens if you progressively saturate the model and what, what type of variation is, uh, is, is very relevant for the results. And I'm done. I think it is a great paper on a very important topic. We want to learn more on, on how these support programs work and what are their effects. And the paper can make an important contribu contribution to the literature. And thank you for your attention. My question might echo what, 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 what Enrique already said. When you were presenting, I was thinking, okay, you have an episode where um, um, the, um, the flow of funding dried out, uh, but there is no sort of a benchmark episode because unemployment might have been reducing over time, and then you, you make a conclusion that uh, exactly that dry, that dry out has had an impact on unemployment. Or, or on employment. What Enrique was talking, Enrique has papers on uh, relationship lending. Actually, if you can look into banks that might be able to provide relationship lending and use them uh, those regions or those banks or those borrowers as a benchmark for comparison, that would give a more solid explanation, more solid causality from the dry up of uh, government funding into employment changes. That's just an idea. I don't know if you have data on, on relationship lending uh, in your banks that you consider, but if you could have this data, that could be very um, useful, I think, insight into what was happening. Uh, okay, so if there is no more question, uh, I mean, you have uh, three minutes to make responses to the concerns. Okay, so uh, since they're easier, I'll deal with the, the, the um, audience first. So I don't have data on relationship lending. The United States does not have a credit registry like other, some other countries do. Uh, we do have the um, stress testing data, which has some information for, which has a, basically every loan, but it has to be a million dollars or bigger and has to be one of the stress tested banks. And these companies are teeny, so virtually none of them are in there. There are some people who have tried to look at this, but the, the if you're a PPP recipient and you were in the stress test, you are a very big firm. So I, I can't really see the prior relationships. In general, we know from surveys of small businesses in the United States that most small firms are completely self-funded by the founders and operate out of retained earnings. And so, um, and, and, and often there's no distinction between the individual and the firm's balance sheet. But um, uh, And those are the sorts of people that we see, but I don't know anything about the pre-existing thing. 
At one point, I tried to merge the SBA data on the PPP with pre-existing um, small business administration loans, and I, I found some firms, but they're a highly non-representative portion, but I could match some of the firms. I didn't end up doing anything with that, but, but, um, but we're talking about a very, very small fraction of the total number of PPP um, firms. And then um, in terms of benchmarking, um, we, what we have done is, as a falsification test, we have declared counterfactually that the window occurred on other dates where it didn't actually happen, where there was no interruption of funds. And as a general matter, if you randomly select three or five days to make such a window early late, you do not get the effects that we detect here. So I don't think that this is a trend unemployment story for that reason. Um, I think that um, the, um, uh, I think that the state map, I guess this was sort of alluded to, I think the state map really understates how granular the variation in delay was. We often have examples of counties that are physically adjacent, and even though they're physically adjacent, one had a late share of 50% and one had a late share of 30%. So this, we think that we got really good mixing on the geography here. Um, I. Um, that you know, the story of my life with this paper has been convincing referees that no, it's not one more thing that's actually causing it. Because if you can find another thing that caused this, you should just do your regression on that thing and not with on what we do. And all I can tell you is that I tried a lot of things, and that. And then the Monte Carlo simulation is the other thing, that like not only could we not find the other thing, but I'm not sure that the, we need another thing to explain this. I think the chance could have explained a lot of what we observed. Um, there is another paper in this area that calls relationship lenders community banks and looks at the market share of community banks to do this, and they also find pretty big effects. So that would be consistent with the fact that if you have clients that are small banks, uh, small, if your banks have small clients, then that's going to lead you to um, do more of these loans early to the people who save more jobs. And so, I mean, I guess that's not that's not that's not a crazy story to me. I basically agree with that. Although, you know, my paper is on a slightly different thing. I, um, I'm around, you know, for the conference, and if you have more questions, please, you know, come say hi. So the objective of loan guarantees, as you know, has been, you know, during the crisis to say, okay, we need to, uh, to encourage lending by shifting default risk uh, to government, and loan guarantee programs are not new. We have been knowing this tool, politic this fiscal tool uh, for decades now. Uh, what has been uh, special of this time around has been the massive scale at which these uh, loan guarantee programs have been uh, used. Um, so we will focus on this uh, paper on a potential policy leakage of this program. That is, uh, um, these guarantees may not generate a commensurate increase in lending. Okay? As uh, banks may substitute guaranteed, with non-guaranteed uh, credit. Uh, in the world of Blanchard, Filippon, Pisani, Ferrini, a policy paper where just in 2020 they examined the different policy fiscal tools used in the COVID-19, they say, well, the problem, they call it the main danger with these uh, loan guarantee programs, is the transfer of existing, uh, pre-existing exposure. A bank with a credit, uh, with exposure to a firm, let me stress the word, could ask the firm to substitute pre-existing credit. So they, they, what is the concern? Is that um, the firm goes to the bank and says, so can you give me the guaranteed loan? The bank says, okay, great, I give it to you, but you repay with this new money, you repay part of the existing, okay? Um, now, in principle, also a firm can ask that to the bank, right? Let's say that you are a good firm. You have no liquidity needs. You are doing well. You know, there is this money available on the table. Say, so why don't you give it? I don't really need it, but why don't you give it to me that I restructure my uh, existing credit? Okay? Um, so the issue of substitution is intertwined with the issue of uh, selection. Who is getting this money? Um, so we use this uh, bank firm level euro area data to investigate first this issue of selection, so which firms, which banks are receiving and are providing these guaranteed loans. Then an issue of substitution, so how much of these guaranteed loans indeed, how much a bank that provides these guaranteed loans actually reduce this non-guaranteed credit, whether this 
vary with firms and bank characteristics and then since we have cross country we see whether this is different France, in Spain, in Italy so the data are this uh, Euro Area Credit Registry and Accredit data uh, and we look at these four uh, largest European Euro Area countries I have only 20 minutes but a lot will be uh, about uh, identification in this uh, talk and the issue is uh, that of course uh, the question is what is the counterfactual no? that you know we observe the guaranteed loan and we see that there is a cut in pre-existing credit but maybe this is a worse this is a bad company we should have received the cutting credit anyways, okay? So in a sense, uh, on, on this, in the US, you know, the people do these uh, PPP loans uh, larger than 500 employees, more than 500 employees. If you do this in, uh, in the Euro area, we will get uh, a handful of companies on, the, on one side of the threshold, okay? So first, uh, the issue of selection. So firm level, one, you get a guaranteed loan, zero, you don't get it, we find that um, firms in more affected sectors, so this is the industry value added growth, they get more, smaller firms, they get it more, but we find some screening in the sense that if we look at firm risk, and here we have the share of arrear in December 2019, so before the crisis hit, they get less, okay? So if they, they, they enter into a crisis already with problems, um, the, the banks were somehow screening them. And these firms were associated more with stronger and larger firms, banks. Sorry. Does it differ across countries? No, different rules, different regulation, different design of the programs. This, the, 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 the selection is qualitatively very similar in these uh, four uh, Euro area countries. So issue of substitution. Now, of course, so before we had companies with guarantee loans, firms without guaranteed loans, we cannot really talk about substitution if firms do not have uh, a guaranteed loan, right? So we need to focus only on firms which got a uh, guaranteed loans. And uh, our dependent variable is the change in non-guaranteed pre-existing credit over to the initial credit. We use a tight window. So between February 2020, August 2020, why such a small window? For identification because we want a moment where there are the highest liquidity needs. Now, we don't want this money to be taken for strategic reasons. No, this is the moment where there is the largest GDP collapse uh, uh, um, in, uh, in several years. Um, and this is also the moment where there is the highest flow of these guaranteed loans in, Euro, in, the, in the Euro area. Just for the sake of, uh, of interpretation, the dependent variable is minus this y okay so what do we find so the dependent variable is this change in non-guarantee pre-existing on the right hand side right hand side guarantee is the amount of guaranteed loan so you get the company get 100,000 euros okay so we we put 100,000 euros on the right hand side variable. so we find an elasticity in a sense that we find that you get one euros of guaranteed loan you have a cut in uh, uh, 13 cents of the non-guaranteed one. This, if we look at the, guarant the total guaranteed loan, but uh, our, en Enrico here has a, has a very nice paper on the, on the importance of the percentage of the guarantees in different programs. Um, if we look instead of the guaranteed amount, we find, uh, since we are, we are reducing the size of the right-hand side variable, we find that this elasticity are, uh, um, are larger around uh, 30 cents, okay? To which firms, to which banks is happening, we find that it's happening more to weak firms and more by larger and stronger banks. But you see that in these, uh, um, in these um, so first of all, is there any different across countries? So yes, here. Yeah. On the amount, of this uh, elasticity, so on the, sorry, on the elasticity, okay? So this is particularly true in Spain and this is less true in France. Germany and Italy, surprisingly, are in the same league on this, okay? So this phenomenon is true in all the countries but it's particularly large in Spain. Maybe at the end I will say a little bit why we think it could be the case. Okay, this happening more in terms of uh, quality, 
the, 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 cross, the, um, the heterogeneity instead is similar, more to weak firms, more by largest and strong banks. Now, see, there is a problem with this selection, with this uh, regression, because guarantee on the right hand side, guarantee you know, is not random. Larger guaranteed amount, smaller guaranteed amount can be different firms. Maybe not with observables, we control for observables, but with unobservables. Maybe larger guaranteed amounts that are worse firms that in any way should have received a cut in credit. Okay? So, so there's still selection going on. Um, so we go at the within firm. So we need to get rid of all the across firms uh, variation. Okay? So let's stick with the same firm. Now the firm is fixed. Okay? So, and we need to see what kind of variation we can exploit, where we exploit the variation between the bank which provides the guaranteed loan and the other bank we don't give the guaranteed loan. So, for instance, take, we are in Italy, Unicredit provides a guaranteed loan, but you're also borrowing from Intesa and Monte dei Paschi, and these guys are not giving the guaranteed loan. So, we compare what happened to the pre existing non guaranteed from Unicredit with relatively to Monte dei Paschi and Intesa. So then uh, the dependent variable is the same, but on the right hand side, variable, right hand side, instead we have a dummy. Zero, one, okay? One is, in my example, Unicredit. So we find that the one which is providing the guarantee loan is cutting 40% of credit relatively to the other, to, um, to the other banks. They're lending to the same firm, but they're not providing the guarantee loan, okay? So this regression, that firm, fixed effect. Again, where is it happening? More for weak firms and more by largest and strongest uh, uh, banks. So you see different identification, but the, um, but the, the results are very similar. Okay, now, are we done? We are not done. Because again, this right-hand side variable, this G, is not dropped from heaven. Zero, one. Why Unicredit is providing a guaranteed loan relatively to the other two institutions, right? So, again, remember, the only, the always our concern is the counterfactual. Maybe Unicredit, the one which is providing a guaranteed loan, has some characteristics for which they would have cut credit anyways, okay? Guarantee is just a veil. So we always have this concern. So here, we got rid of the across firms variation, but still there is an across banks variation, which could, is not, could be non random and maybe is biased in our results. Um, so these are those banks that we know there is a bias, but we know the bias goes in the opposite direction. Strong banks, relationship banks are the ones that in a crisis they provide more credit, not less. Okay? So if anything, this should lower this uh, substitution um, that we find. Okay, two other concern of these results. First of all, are they cutting credit? So what is the idea of Blanchard? No, you say, I give you the guarantee loan, but you need to repay the existing. Maybe, maybe there is no active decision to cut. Maybe these loans were maturing, and you know, at the moment of rolling over, now there is this guaranteed program, so I roll over with this. Okay? So we show that this is not uh, the case. First of all, because if we go here, uh, you see residual maturity of the relationship as a positive sign. So the Unicredit is the one with larger residual maturity, not the opposite. It's not the one, okay, you have three banks, the one which is going to mature during this window, this is the bank which is providing the, the guaranteed credit. No, this is not the case, okay? Unicredit was the one with the largest residual maturity. Second, so we get very similar results. We drop everything, all the bank relationship where the credit is maturing, in fact, during that period. Now, let me go back to the original uh, question uh, uh, of demand, supply of substitution, okay? Um, so remember, the concern Blanchard, Pisani, Ferri, uh, they say, well, the bank is asking the firm. Uh, and then we said, well, maybe it could be the other way around. It's the firm asking the bank, okay? So 
our evidence is indeed the case that is a supply story. Two pieces of evidence. First of all, the substitution is the strongest for the weak firms. Okay? So remember in my example, if there was the, the strong firm, it's more likely to go to the bank and say, look, I don't really need, I don't have liquidity need. Okay? So give it to me and I restructure. Instead, no, we are finding this is particularly true for firms with massive liquidity needs in, the, in those three months of the worst lockdown, okay? Second, so we also look at interest rates and maturity. So in an accredit, this data uh, exists, you know, because we know all the other, other dimension of the, um, of the contracts, and we find that the loans where we observe, the firm back relationship where we observe this substitution are the ones with higher interest rates, lower maturity, okay? So in a 101 uh, econ class, lower quantity, more price, sounds like supply, okay? So just to conclude, on the whole we found good selection in the sense that uh, in Europe, uh, in the Euro area, the guaranteed loans were indeed directly to firms which were in affected sector, um, were smaller, which is no typical proxy for credit constraint. So I'm done. If I, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. You know, you prefer at home, no? But then when you go, you speak fast. It's always much less. Um, and it's also, I'm the last one, so you know, I think it's nice to, to be faster, as Ralph is, in fact, very happy. Um, so let me, let me, no, just to say that, uh, you know, despite these different, uh, rules institution, we find very similar uh, selection across all these countries. We think we are the first to document this issue of substitution between guarantee and non-guarantee. Smallest in France, largest in Spain. So let me use 30 seconds for this. So why in France is so small? And in f so this stuff is not illegal, okay? So in a sense, so the, this, this is not illegal in the sense that uh, the regulation does not prohibit to substitute. But what is surprising is that France, in fact, is the toughest in terms of regulation. It says uh, that you need, uh, sorry, it's the other way around, it's the, it's the, la it's the very lax. So it only says, uh, look, if you give this guaranteed loan, you need to show that you give one euro more to the company, okay? Despite, despite this, we find that, in fact, it's the smallest. It could be uh, to do with, uh, with enforcement, to the fact that uh, maybe the Ministry of Finance were overseeing this and were really taught for new loans. Okay, so, this seems more of a supply, this is more consistent with the supply story, with the evidence that we get. Any policy upside? Potentially two. Bank recapitalization. This the risking uh, could have been positive insofar as that now banks are strongest since part of the risk is going to the government and now they can lend more when the crisis is finished. The other is less debt overhang. We are so concerned that now these firms go out of the crisis with so much new debt well, as long as there have been some substitution, and as long as the substitution was particularly true for weak firms, there is less debt of hand going forward. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And, and I will try to emulate Reiner, who has already left, uh, and, <laughs> and say uh, I believe almost anything in here. Uh, there's one exception. But typically, it's, it's on pre-crisis earnings. Um, and, uh, and you require the bank, you know, you have to have 5% or 10% loss exposure or something like this, so that the bank still has uh, all the right incentives while extending the loans, and then the government might pay some fee for, to the bank, and the banks are happy. But that usually should avoid shifting these risks to the, um, uh, shifting the risk of the worst firms to the government, right? That's specifically designed to avoid all of these things that uh, Planchard and his causes were concerned about, right? They are concerned about that you have 10% of your loans are crappy and they think, oh, you just offload these 10% of the loans. But that is precisely what a lot of these policies, and you have them in the appendix, they avoid to design. So what it really does in my, at least in COVID, right? I mean, COVID is special, we all agree on that. In COVID, it was really taking care of this economy by tail risk, right? Not all hospitality services were in bad shape right before COVID. They did fine, 
But then this shock happens and they basically have to shut down. There's nothing they can do about it. Now, um, with that in mind, what I think, like in addition, like you call it bank recapitalization, I just think about it more generally. What you do is with these loan guarantees in COVID, you perhaps have enhanced financial stability to the extent that you stabilize the firms. Thereby, you reduce um, the risk in banks' books. And that, of course, is really good because we like this. And eventually, you probably avoid bank bailouts, right? You even, nobody said this explicitly, or at least I think nobody said this explicitly when they talked about this. Uh, it's not popular after the financial crisis to implicitly bail out banks. But um, so we implicitly perhaps have bailed out banks. But that's a good thing. Right? We, we didn't even let people question the um, quality of banks' books by basically having blanket guarantees or the PPP program or something like that. So, uh, and I think that might be useful to just point out. Um, currently, I think the paper is really focused on this Blochard argument, and, and I think there can be arguments against this. So let me run you through this. So the take-up varies across countries. You have briefly talked about this. I would like... Um, this, this table one is a little hard to read, so I would have this clearer in the paper saying like, here why you have differences in the country, like highlight the French example, for instance, um, and be a little clearer, right? And then there's a question with other uh, interactions, right? So I look at it like in, in Germany, it's like 7,500 firms, it's basically nothing. And that's perhaps there are other policies that also is, like Kurzarbeit in Germany means the people pay less but get full wage and the wage subsidy comes from the government, which is almost the same as guaranteed loans in, in, in that sense, right? So there could be some of this. And uh, Germany, is, in that sense, is not so different from the US. Right here, you have PPP in the US. But when you think about Main Street lending program, we spent like, what, 14 billion of loans total? I mean, that's nothing, right? The main, and the Main Street was precisely pre designed the same way, had skin in the game, had a leverage constraint. Nothing happened. OK. So. Um, I have one more demand check for you, and this is where I said like I wasn't completely convinced. Where I wasn't completely convinced is actually on the interest rate argument. What really matters, at least to me, is um, you run the analysis on maturity and interest rate of the guaranteed loan, and you see what's coming next, right? You must have known this. So what really matters is the difference in the interest rate. Like how much does this firm actually save? And my understanding was that in anti credit, you do know the interest rate on the old credit as well. So what we really care about is how much does this firm save? And it could be actually a good deal for the firms as well. So that's the last thing that I really would like you to do is, is tell us like basically how much interest do these firms saving? And maybe they save a lot, who knows? Um, and that would be uh, quite useful. So in the end, what I would do is I would put on the left-hand side the difference between um, uh, the interest rate of the old and the guaranteed loan and we'll correlate this with the share that you call substitution. And that would basically get to that. OK, so you can, you can a little bit more of identification, right? Here. So now I'm going into the other direction from Enrico and say, like, throw in more fixed effects. <laughs> um, but you saw that coming, right? You can have, in, depending on the specification, you can have bank fixed effects. You can have industry select county fix, uh, fixed effects in, in the product specification. You can. Anyway, so the this infirm variation, I just want to point this out. In, in your, I mean, there's nothing you don't know, right? So only larger firms have multiple banks, blah, 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 blah. It's nice for identification. Uh, and I think it's very important in the paper to highlight what's going on here is um, uh, the issue of, yes, we run this exercise to nail identification. External validity, we just more or less thrown out of the window. That's OK if you also tell us exactly how this new sample compares. Like I saw that French firms are very, like very few French firms had actually multiple banks, right? And that then, you, you just need to explain this a little bit more. Give us a little table that um, is a little bit more insightful in what's remaining in that sample and how we should interpret these results. So then the interpretation of question is exactly these large banks and the banks with the higher capital buffers. Like, why? Um, anything that helps us to understand why this happens, I think, would be very, very useful. It could be just them having better access to these government programs, right? Because they tend to be better connected. Um, 
and anything you have here would be uh, useful, but um, there is a, and that's driven by Italy and Spain, so my off the cup answer was, well, perhaps uh, I think Italian bank books are still not particularly great. You can correct me on that, but uh, I thought there were some lingering issues. I don't know how, how Spanish banks look like. I don't know, so I just throw this out as like a random comment um, that, uh, you know, there could be still some gambling for resurrection of VK banks going on, but I'm not sure. Now, um, nitpicks. I didn't quite understand why the number of observations change between some tables when you add stuff, because everything you have, you should have from Anna credit, so I couldn't figure this out. Um, this is just cleanup, right? Um, you say you have a measure of risk, but to be clear, the measure of risk is the fraction of credit in arrears, and if you look at the summary stats, it's very, very few firms, and that makes sense, because the firms were actually excluded from the program in the first place. Right? I mean, they are most likely being cut out. So I'm not entirely sure w what's, what's measured here. In fact, I would like to know how they even got a credit. They shouldn't get guaranteed credits, right? Uh, and of course, for Enrico, I can't help it. Standard errors. <laughs> um, I mean, here I think actually the country industry uh, level does matter, um, simply because this is where the variation lives, right? Hospitality will look very different from anything else. In Minor points. Okay, anyway, I really like the paper. I think it's a great paper that tells us a lot about substitution and risk shifting. Um, when I say identification can be strengthened, eh, I think the demand side thing is a little bit the bigger fish here, but I also would like to see a little bit more of discussion of, um, the, I, I'm going to call it the positive effects and not just the um, blush out this all sucks uh, few. Thanks. <laughs>